page 262. We're going to sing Holy, 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 page number 262. All four verses. Kevin, would you open us up in a word of prayer, please? Amen. All right, you can be seated this morning, and we do welcome you and greet you to our worship service here this Lord's Day at Parkwood Baptist Church. Good to see each of you out. And we're good to be. We're glad to be back home. Of course, we were in Mississippi the past uh, last week, and uh, uh, we're glad to, glad to be home. I preached twice last Sunday, uh, uh, Sunday morning for my first cousin, and then Sunday night for my uncle Ronnie uh, at Unity Baptist Church. Had a good. Two good worship services then, but we're certainly glad to be back. I know you enjoyed uh, the preaching ministry of Brother John Collier. He's just a, just a gentleman and uh, just a great man. I appreciate him filling in on Sunday. And then I know you enjoyed Brother Kevin Vargas on Wednesday night, and I appreciate Kevin filling in Wednesday evening. Uh, let me make a few announcements, and we'll get, get back into our song service. Uh, Vacation Bible School starts tomorrow, and, uh, and so... Trust that you will be in prayer for that. Uh, we've got at this time about 37 kids registered. Now that doesn't include a dozen in the nursery. And, uh, and then there's 24 volunteers. And so please pray for, um, please pray for that. As a matter of fact, uh, to make it easy on you, there's some prayer lists uh, on the bulletin table. If you'll grab one, I think they're divided by class. And then there's names of some of the kids that are registered for VBS. And so if you'll take one of those and... And uh, you can use that to pray specifically for those children. And we trust that, uh, trust that we'll have a good week uh, teaching them about the Lord this week, Vacation Bible School. So uh, make that a matter of prayer. That starts tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., runs through Friday, and uh, 9 to 12 each day. All right, ladies, you have a Bible study starting uh, in a little over a week on July the 30th. Um, that's on a Tuesday. It's a weekly Bible study. You have two opportunities to come, one in the morning and one in the evening. The one in the morning will start at 9.30 a.m. if uh, that's more convenient for you. 
And, uh, but if not, then you can attend the one at 6.30 p.m. Um, and uh, if you have any, any questions, see Ms. Lou Ann Shepard or Ms. Carol Smith. Uh, it says pre-order your book and sign up for the session you plan to attend. Uh, assuming there's a sign-up sheet available for that. Now, if you plan to attend, books have been taken care of, the cost of them, and so just make sure you sign up to receive one and we'll get that ordered for you. Uh, let's see. Uh, August the 4th, just around the corner, a couple Sundays away. I'm excited about this. Uh, Brother David Ring will be preaching in the morning service. And uh, if you are not familiar with David Ring, you need to Google his name and listen to him on YouTube preach. Um, he's going to do an excellent job, I'm sure. He's born with cerebral palsy, but he has been used, uh, used all over this country, literally all over this world. Uh, God has used him as an evangelist, and so he'll be here on, on Sunday morning, August the 4th. You need to make plans to be here for that and invite someone to, to come and hear Brother David Ring preach. Uh, starting this week as well, if you get a chance to go up, it's a little bit of a drive, but north of us, about four hours in Canton, Texas, where Dennis Irwin and his family host the East Texas Baptist Camp Meeting, and, uh, and so if you get a chance to, to attend that, there'll be a different speaker each night, different singers each night coming in, um, and uh, there's some flyers, I think, put out on this secret sister table, but if you get a chance, you might look at that if you'd like to attend. East Texas Baptist Camp Meeting this week. I know Brother Dennis would appreciate that very much. All right. Well, I don't know of any other announcements. Miss Kathleen McKinney has a birthday this week. Uh, she's not able to be here for health reasons, but we certainly wish Miss Kathleen a happy birthday. Brother Derek, Miss Nadine Dacus have an anniversary this week as well. I don't see either of them either, So, but happy anniversary to them. All right, Brother Ken, well, let's get back into our song service this morning. Once again, if you will, page 257, The Comforter Has Come, we'll do all three verses of page 257. Oh, spread the tidings round, wherever man is found, wherever human hearts and human woes abound, let every Christian tongue proclaim the joyful sound, the come. Page 270, Wonderful Words of Life. We'll do all three verses of page 270. Sing them over again to me, the wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, the wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words. 
Our ushers will come, and uh, we will take our morning tithes and offerings right now, and we trust that you will give as God has prospered you in accordance to his word this morning. Jesus. All right, Lee, pray for us, okay, buddy? This will say this is my favorite male vocalist singing, so got Andrew coming. <clears throat> Who am I that the Lord of all the earth? Would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt. Who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever wandering heart? Not because of who I am. But because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am the flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind, still you hear me when I'm calling. Lord, you catch me when I'm falling, 
and you told me who I am. I am yours. I am yours. Who am I that the eyes that see my sin would look on me with love and watch me rise again? Who am I that the voice that calmed the sea would calm the storm in me and calm the storm in me? Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am the flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind. Still you hear me when I'm calling. Lord, you catch me when I'm falling. And you told me who I am. I am yours. Appreciate that very much. Enjoyed that song for a few, for a while now. I believe it was made famous by a group Casting Crowns, but... Uh, Great job singing that. We appreciate it very much. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Judges chapter number 2. Judges chapter 2 this morning. We will pick up in our study through the book of Judges. Now, we haven't been here in a few weeks uh, due to a mission trip I took to South Dakota, uh, and then July 4th, and then it's going last Sunday. But... As far as I know, my traveling is done for a little while anyways, and, and uh, so we'll, we'll pick back up in our study through the book of Judges this morning. Now, the story of Judges, the, the book of Judges is really the story of Israel's rebellion and their longing for a king. Uh, they thought that a king would solve their problems. Now, they were right, but they were also wrong at the same time. They needed a king just wasn't the earthly king that they thought they needed. They needed an eternal king, and by the way, they already had one. Um, I told you a few weeks ago that they should have spent their time bowing before the king they had instead of begging for the king that they thought they wanted. Now, having read the book of Judges in preparation for this series, there are a lot of dark passages, a lot of, a lot of sobering, very sobering passages in in this book, um, and that's what life is like when men live like they have no ruler, and when every man does that which is right in his own eyes. The, the balance of chapter number two continues to be a bit of an overview for the whole book. Um, the Lord lays out the general theme, the direction of the book of Judges in chapter one and chapter number two, and, and so what we see here again is this vicious cycle uh, we call it the sin cycle. It characterizes the entire book. It begins with sin, then there's suffering. That leads to supplication, and ultimately God would hear their prayers, and he would send a judge to save them, and the cycle would then repeat itself again. And notice what the Bible says as we close out chapter 2 this morning in verse number 11. Judges chapter 2, verse 11. The Bible says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods, the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves to them, and provoked the Lord to anger. Verse 13 says, And they forsook the Lord, and served Baal and Ashtaroth. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. And whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Verse 16, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them, and yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a whoring after other gods, and bowed themselves unto them. 
They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge, for it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers. In following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them, they ceased not from their own doings nor from their stubborn ways. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, Because that this people has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice, I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died, that through them I may prove Israel whether they'll keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. You see the sin cycle repeated multiple times in this text. Now in this text, three different times, Samuel, the human penman, the human author of this book, more than likely uses the word against to describe God's relationship to Israel. The relationship of God and his chosen uh, covenant people in this instance was not that he was for them, but that he and his hand were literally against them. And as surely as the unrivaled sovereignty of God means that if God be for you, it doesn't matter who is against you. It has to mean that if God be against you, it doesn't matter who's for you. If someone in this room does not know Christ as Lord and Savior, if you've never been saved, if you don't know for sure that if you were to pass away today that your sins would be forgiven, that heaven is your future home, you need to understand how the Bible describes you. Describes you literally as an enemy of God, as a stranger, as an alien from the promises of God. If you are not for the Lord, you are against the Lord. There is no fence straddling. If you are not saved, you are in a position, the Bible says, where God himself is literally against you. The story of Judges, chapter number 2, is really the story of my life. And if you're honest, it's the story of your life as well. It's what I've titled this message, The Story of My Life, and it's a drama of grace that's told in three different acts. Notice with me, number one, this story is all about a sinful life. I see that in verses 11 through 14 and others. Indeed, these were days when there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And, and by the way, I've learned, I've lived long enough to know that when every man does what he calls right, most of the time it's wrong. Now, if you think America is upside down with open sin parading down Main Street and immoral politicians running our nation into the ground, then you've got a pretty good idea, a pretty good glimpse of Israel in these days. Their life was marked as a sinful life, and it was characterized three different ways. Notice how predictable it was. It was as predictable as the changing of the ocean tides. Verse 11, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Why? Well, because of what precedes verse 11, because of what verse 10 says. Verse 10 says that there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, and yet, uh, nor the works which the Lord had done for Israel. Now, why were they so quick? to forsake a God who had done so much for them. Simply put, because they had not been taught about what the Lord had done. And that's where that road leads. Let me make this practical for you and I. Parents, pay attention to what I'm about to say. This is, this is vital. Small compromises of the parents led to a total collapse of the children and the grandchildren. Israel learned the hard way that partial obedience is always the mother of full-grown disobedience. 
What you're going to find in the book of Judges is, is one generation lived around the Canaanites, the next generation lived among the Canaanites, and the next generation, two generations removed, lived just like the Canaanites. One generation refused to tear down the idols of Baal and Ashtaroth, and the next generation is bowing down to those idols. But we cannot ultimately blame the previous generation. For even though this, uh, this generation of Jews did not know what the Lord had done for their parents, they did know what the Lord had done for them. Th th they're responsible, ultimately, for their own rebellion. But it's proof positive that, that man's problem is not his environment. And man's problem is not his education or his lack thereof. And even though his environment might be bad and his education may be poor, the heart of the problem, as Spurgeon said, is the problem of the heart. They had a sinful heart that manifested into a sinful life. It was predictable. But notice how provoking. Verse 12, the Bible says, And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods, of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. Notice verse 14, And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. They forsook the Lord, the Bible says. That word forsook there means to depart. It means to leave behind. It, it, it means to walk away from. We would use that word today to describe maybe a deadbeat dad who abandons his children, abandons his wife, and he leaves them to, to sort of fend for themselves. These people abandon the Lord. Now, this is not merely a matter of them making their own decisions. This is an issue of rebellion against God. This is the God who brought them up, brought them out, brought them in. Uh, God brought them up and provided for them. But the very first chance they got, they forsook him. It is utterly ridiculous. It makes about as much sense as caffeine-free Diet Coke to this preacher right here. They provoked the Lord to anger. In September of 2021, popular evangelical website titled churchleaders.com carried what, what I believe to be the most ridiculous story that I've ever seen in my life. Um, matter of fact, the headline of this story made you think that it was, that it was uh, a joke, that it was maybe something by the popular Christian site, the Babylon Bee, that satire site, but, but it's not. It's very real. Living Faith Church, located in downtown San Diego, describes itself, I quote, as a Christian charismatic church and is pastored by two entrepreneurs, one of whom is an active porn star. I quote, brand new inclusive Christian church in downtown San Diego. Come be a part of an amazing community that's non-judgmental, open-minded, fun, and loves Jesus. I quote, where else will you find an adult actress who is also a pastor? This is a unique church that welcomes all sinners but glorifies Jesus Christ. And the husband and wife, names I won't mention, met at an Assemblies of God Bible College where he earned his degree in theological studies. She's an ordained minister, but she's also presently, actively working in the adult industry. So, Pastor, what do you think about that? Well, number one, I don't think they learned that from the Assembly of God Bible College. Uh, now, you say what you want about them, but I have some friends in that denomination. They love Jesus Christ with all their heart. Number two, I think they heard a mule braying at the moon and mistook it for a call to preach and a call of God, um, if you want my honest opinion. The actions of these Jews are utterly ridiculous, but no less ridiculous than the actions of backslidden Baptists, modern-day demises who, who forsake the Lord for the things of this world. Now, every parent, grandparent in this room knows what it's like to do and do and do and do and do for your child only to have them turn their back on you uh, with a heart of ingratitude. When it happens to you, it will make you sad and it might make you mad. And yet, when it happens to the Lord, it provokes him to anger. It's predictable. It's provoking. Notice how perilous it was. Verse 14, the Bible says, And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. <coughs> the Bible says that God the Father sold his own people into the hands of their enemies. Two of the three times that the text says that God was 
against them. Two of the three occur right here. Let me just put it this way, practically speaking. It will never go well for you or me or anyone else disobeying God. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, around verse 30 or 31, that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. For years, a man by the name of Marius Ailes played with his pet hippopotamus. He had found this baby hippo as a calf, and, and uh, he raised it like you would a dog or a cat, a domestic pet. He bathed it, he brushed its teeth, he played fetch with his hippo. He gave it a name, name Humphrey, Humphrey the Hippo. He told a local news reporter, he said, there's, I quote, there's a relationship between me and Humphrey, and that's what people don't understand. They think you can only have a relationship with dogs or cats or domestic animals, but I have a relationship with the most dangerous animal in Africa. You know where I'm going with this. December 16th, 2022, Ailes went swimming with Humphrey. Humphrey got hungry. Humphrey ate Marius Ailes. Such is the fate of anybody who tries to play around with sin, thinking you can handle it, that you can deal with it. Oh, you say you can drink in moderation while others can't. Uh, you can talk like that and still control your relationship because you're better than everyone else. You're stronger than everyone else. You're wiser than everyone else. Friend, it won't end one bit better for you than it did for Marius Ailes. It won't, it won't go one bit better for you than it did the nation of Israel. There's an old saying, if you play with fire, you're going to get burned. It's apparently true with hippos, and it is true with sin. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse number 12, the Bible says there is a way that seems right unto man. And by the way, that's why you want to argue about, about it. That's why you want to justify it, because there's a way that seems right unto man. But the Bible says that the end of that is death. Listen to me, church. You make your decisions on the unchanging, uncompromising standard. You better make your decisions, not on your emotions, not on your feelings, not on what rings your bell or floats your boat or scratches your itch or lights your fire. You better make your decisions based on the uncompromising standard found in the pages of God's Word. As a boy, I used to love the show The Incredible Hulk. I, not the cartoon that my boys watch, but the real one with Bill Bixby and Lou Perino. And uh, Bigsby's character, David Banner, would always say, please don't make me angry. Please don't make me angry. You won't like me when I'm angry. And two times in this passage, it says the Lord is angry. And by the way, if your God is never angry, you've got the wrong God. You need to get another one. Don't make the Lord angry because even though he is slow to anger, even though he is full of mercy and patience, it is not impossible to make him angry. And Israel did not like it when the Lord was angry, and neither will you or I or America for, as far as that goes. Their story is a story of a sinful life. Their story is one of steadfast love. The same love that would later be, be demonstrated that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us is on graphic display right here. The book of Judges really is a two-sided coin that shows the wickedness of the people of God alongside the compassion that God has for his people. Now, I, am, I come this morning to give God praise. I am glad that the story of my life is not just the story of my life. It's the story of my rebellious life in light of the righteous, perfect life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how does he show that? How does he, he give his love to his people? Well, a few ways. Number one, by chastening them. Notice in verse 15, whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. And we just finished studying the book of Hebrews on Wednesday nights, and of course, can't forget that passage in chapter number 12 where the writer of the book of Hebrews said that whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Now, if... Uh, if we're honest, this is probably one of those ways we wish God would be a little less loving. Uh, my daddy used to wear me out. And he'd say, now, son, I love you. And I'm thinking, man, you, you wish you didn't love me near as much. <laughs> but, uh, but God's steadfast love is demonstrated here in his faithfulness to discipline his children. Now, this is, again, this is, again, one of those ways we probably wish our parents and God were a little less loving and faithful. 
The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 15, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Proverbs 23, 14, Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shall deliver his soul from hell. Now, if you want to, I want you to notice that, that this discipline, it's described in the text around uh, verse 14, verse 15, that as the Lord had said and as the Lord had sworn. There are some Bible theologians and Bible teachers that have a big problem today with the judgment of God. They don't like it. They try to justify it away. But when you see the Lord pouring out his discipline, his chastisement, do me a favor. Look back a few verses. Look back a chapter or two, a page or two in your Bible, and you will see that you'll, you'll see that his righteous indignation is always preceded by warning after warning after warning after warning. And it's not because it's not because God is some overly permissive grandpa who counts to ten four or five times before he does anything. It is because he is slow to anger. He's abounding in mercy. He is quick to forgive. And I wonder this morning if maybe your presence in this room today may be that God loves you enough that he puts you under the sound of preaching to, to warn you that there is devastation at the end of the road that you're currently on. I beg you by the mercy of God. Listen to God. Listen to his word. He chastises them. But his love is shown in the fact that he cares for them. Notice in verse 16, I have this first line, this first word underlined in my Bible. It's a good word. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. Nevertheless, aren't you glad for a nevertheless God? That means in spite of, not because of. Now, I'm going to be very transparent with you this morning. I've got a confession I need to make. When I read these verses, there's a part of me, my flesh, Man, I want God to zap them. Just give them what they deserve. Man, I read these verses, and I, I mean over and over and over again. The book of Judges is like a broken record. Over and over and over again, you see sin followed by suffering, followed by supplication, followed by God sending a judge and saving them, but it's not followed by sanctified holy living. They don't learn their lesson. They repeat that cycle over and over and over and over again. And a part of me, as I'm reading this, a part of me says, God, just zap them. Kill them. Give them what they deserve. And when I feel that, I sense God's voice say to me, you don't want me to be that kind of God because it wouldn't go any better for you. And then I'm reminded of all the reasons that I don't want a God who pours out unmitigated wrath on rebellious children because I'm probably chief of them. And isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing how we want a God of wrath for everybody else's sin? But when it comes to me personally, I'd rather have a God of mercy for my own. He chastens them. Shows his love by caring for them. And then he shows his commitment to them in verse 17 and 18, and yet they would not hearken unto their judges. But, and the language here is the language of, of them committing adultery against God. They went a-whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. Indeed, the sad story of my life, I'll speak for myself, I'm sure it's the same for you, though, you could write a song about it called, Great is Thy Unfaithfulness. But thankfully, even in my sinful ways, in my infidelity, in my wickedness, I can still say, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Jeremiah said in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22, verse 23, that it is because the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Can I paraphrase that for you? It's because of God's mercies that I'm not a that I'm not a black mark on, on a concrete somewhere, that I'm, not, that I'm still here because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The faithfulness of God, his commitment to his people and, and to his promises. It, do, it, creates, it creates sort of a dilemma 
It's a dilemma that we talked about multiple times in our study in the book of Hebrews. Here it is. God has promised to bless his people, but he's also promised to pour out his wrath against all sin. And so how can God save and deliver his people while maintaining his own holy commitment to punish every one of their sin? How can he both, as Paul put it, be just and the justifier of sin? Lean in close to the text because the answer to that question is actually the greatest news that has ever fallen upon human ear. It's the greatest news that's ever touched human heart. The story of their life is one of a sinful life. The story of their life is that of steadfast love. Thankfully, the story of their life is that of a saving Lord. I told you when we started this series that our goal is to find Jesus in Judges. And I told you then that the blood of Jesus is going to drip from every page in this dark, dark book. Like a professional jeweler will take a brilliant diamond and and put it on display on top of a black velvet cloth so that the black cloth reveals the brilliance of the diamond. God has set out the black cloth of sin and rebellion so that we can see the radiant light and the, the beauty of Jesus Christ. How do we do that in this dark passage? Well, a few ways. Number one, they needed a maker who would listen to them. Notice in verse 18, it says, And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. Now that word groan, you ought to pay attention. It's an interesting word. It only occurs four times in the Bible in the Hebrew text. Of course, it appears one time here, two times in the book of Exodus where the Lord heard the groans of his people in Egypt. Two times in Exodus it says God heard their groans. He remembered his covenant with his people. And the fourth time, the only other time, is in the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 30, where the prophet uh, describes, uh, God describes by the prophet the groanings of a fatally wounded man in Ezekiel 30, a desperate man with a deadly wound, and he's groaning, he's crying out, realizing that he can't help himself. In other words, the groaning here in verse number 18, the groaning is not the grumbling of a man who thinks that God is unfair. The groaning here is not the griping of a man who thinks that God has done him wrong, God doesn't love him. This is the groaning of a man who realizes that the mess that he is sitting in is covered in his own fingerprint. This is the groaning of a man that realizes that the recipe for his disaster is one that he cooked himself. This is the groaning of a man who says, I am where I am because I did what I did. God, I am where I am because I deserve what I got. But God, I am begging you, would you please have mercy on a guilty sinner like me? Every mother in this room knows what it's like to to hear the cry of her child. There may be 50 children around But when that her baby cries, she knows immediately, that's my child. That's my child. Well, our Heavenly Father, in a similar way, knows how to hear the cries of his children. David said in Psalms chapter number 40, I believe it is, I cried to the Lord, and he inclined his ear to me. You know, there may be a relationship in your life right now that you you have sinned against someone so much that they no longer speak to you. They no longer respond to your text messages, your emails, return your phone calls. They don't even acknowledge your existence. But I am telling you this morning that the one you've sinned against the most will never turn a blind eye to your lifted hand, a deaf ear to your lifted voice, a hard heart to your lifted plea. David said in Psalm 34, verse 17, the righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers them from their trouble. What do you call that? You call it grace. You call it grace. You may not know what to do in your situation this morning. I can give you a little bit of advice. If you'll groan in the presence of God, you'll get in this altar on your face before God and and, and groan and call out to him, you'll meet a God who still says, if my people are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then i will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land they needed a maker that would listen but they needed a master that would lead verse 18 again when the lord raised them up judges notice this phrase the lord was with the judge 
and the Lord delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. Over and over, the Lord himself, in nothing more than grace and mercy and kindness, raised up a deliverer. Now, in the coming months on Sunday mornings, we're going to meet them one by one. But here in this overview section, chapter number two, uh, Samuel just kind of lumps them all together. He just kind of passes by and puts them all in one category. And so we'll do the same this morning. But I will point out one thing. By most accounts, there are 12 judges. If you read Bible scholars and commentators, most will agree there are 12, uh, 12 judges by most accounts. Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Gideon, Tola, Jair, Jephthah, um, Samson, Abdon, Ibsen, and Eli. Half of those or more, many of you have never even heard of. But you don't have to know their name. You realize they never existed for you to know their names? They existed to point you to the, your need of one whose name would be above every other name. These men, along with Sister Deborah, were mightily used by God, but they were flawed. They were sinful. They were weak. They were inadequate and they were insufficient. What Israel needed was a perfect judge. No, better yet, they needed a perfect, righteous judge. King And thank God we have one in King Jesus. They needed a maker who would listen. They needed a master that would lead. But they needed, lastly, a Messiah who would live. Verse 19 says, It came to pass when the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers. It's here that we must be reminded that the book of Judges is not a story unto itself. It is a part of what we call the meta-narrative of Scripture, the big story of the Bible. It's just one scene in a much longer movie, and it has one star, and it is the Son of God, Jesus Christ himself. And it's here that we see glimpses of glory and a picture of Christ. You see, the problem that Israel had was that Israel's leaders just kept dying. That's how the whole problem started. It started with Moses and his death, and then the death of Joshua. And then now you have the death of each of these judges. And afterward, after doing good for a little while, they, the judge dies and Israel returns to their sin like a dog returns to its vomit. If only, if only the Lord would place over them, if only the Lord would place over us a strong ruler who could live and never die. If only the father would raise up a ruler who, who wouldn't die. To do so, he would have to be a sinless man because the wages of sin always is death. If only one could, could come and sit on a throne who was never had a beginning and never has an ending, from everlasting to everlasting, a kingly priest who would reign forever and forever. Anybody, anybody know who I've got on my mind? Somebody whose name is the Alpha and the Omega the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the one who was dead but is now alive forevermore. Friend, the inadequacy of these judges ought to make our hearts long for and cry out for a righteous judge who is better, who's higher, who's greater than any judge that this world has ever known. Friend, what we need when we stray is a king who's never strayed. And what we need when we sin is a king who's never sinned. We need a king who rules forever because he lives forever to make intercession for his people. What we really need is a king who once had God turn against him and forsake him so that God would never have to be against us and forsake us. In Romans chapter number 8, now I'm almost done. The Apostle Paul put it this way. He said, he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Going back to this dilemma, how can God save and deliver his people while maintaining his own holy commitment to punish all of their sins? How can God be both just and the justifier of sins? The answer to that dilemma and all of life's dilemma, for that matter, is Jesus Christ. 
I said this in my introduction, and I'll say it again, and I'm done. If God be for you, the Bible says, who can be against you? If God be for you, it doesn't matter who's against you. But on the other side of that coin, if God be against you, it really doesn't matter who's for you. And all of that is determined by what you do with Jesus Christ. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning. Brother Ken, if you and our musicians will come at this time. Let me ask you a simple question this morning. Are you saved? Are you saved? Born again. Said an everlasting yes to Jesus Christ. You know beyond the shadow of any doubt that if you were to die today that heaven is your home, that God is your Lord, he's your Savior. Do you know that? Do you know that? If not, if not, you need to understand the Bible describes you as an enemy of God, that God is literally against you. And it's because he's so holy and you're so sinful. He is so right and righteous and I am so wrong and wicked. And that's a dilemma, that's a problem. But a solution is given. Again, going back to Romans 8, God spared not his own son. He sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to earth. To walk around sinful man like you and like me, and he lived 33 years of absolute perfection, tempted in all points like you, yet without sin. Went to Calvary's cross as a perfect man, died a brutal death, one that you deserved, one that I deserve. Died in my place, died in yours. And now, according to the word of God, all of those who place their faith and their hope in the death, the burial, and the resurrection. They placed a dead man in a tomb. He stayed that way for three days, but he rose from the dead. Now he lives forevermore to make intercession for you and I. If you'll place your faith in that, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Bible says you will be saved. Have you done that? Have you done that? If not, why don't you come today and give your heart to Jesus Christ? Let us take God's word and show you how you can be saved, born again. It's the most important decision you'll ever make. And God has done the work. Matter of fact, Jesus said, before he gave up the ghost, it is finished. The story is complete. The good news of the gospel is for you and for me. Would you accept him today? Father, I bow in your presence. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for those who are lost this morning that you would convict them of their sin, that they would come and give their heart to you today. In Christ's name I pray, amen. What number, Brother Ken? 251.